once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Here once again, being in Waynesville, North Carolina. Up on the mountain, snowed in. Hallelujah. So I'm here with my sweet patootie Alice. With Howdy. Lynn, with Lynn and John. We're in John's house here on the top of the mountain. Lynn and John's. We're at Lynn and John's house on the top of the mountain. Where we can't get out. <laughs> Okay, but that's fine. That's fine. Uh, we're continuing on in our study of the evidence of a redeemed life. And remember, the purpose of this is, has been, since we started, um, this is the, the, the eighth, eighth, the eighth, the eighth so part. this is you know, the eighth part of this. Um, so we've been looking at this, and the purpose is because it says in the Word that we're, we're supposed to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. If we are redeemed, that means we have Christ in us, we're new creations. And what we're supposed to be testing ourselves and looking at is, is, that, is the evidence of that new life visible in our lives. First of all, it has to be visible to the Lord. <clears throat> Can He see? Now, He searches the heart. Yes. Good thing. Praise God. But when you look at yourself, are you seeing, you know, is your life lining up with the Word of God? Right. And when other people see you, are you bringing, you know, visibly bringing that presence of Jesus Christ into the places that you go? Because that's the ministry that we have. So it turns out we've, we started this and then kind of went straight into the fruit of the Holy Spirit because Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that you'll know them by their fruit. So uh, the fruit of the Spirit, of course, are in Galatians chapter 5. And we're looking at them and, and not... So we can test other people or test other things, but so that we can honestly examine ourselves and see if if we are living that life right. can we that see Christ the, desires. Can we see the world in us or can we see the word in yeah, us? That's what we gotta look at. So in any event, the last last part we talked about faithfulness. Faith and faithfulness. Yes. And before we start on the, the next one, which is gentleness, I I just want to mention what we ended with in faithfulness, all right? Mm -hmm. I read from Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, that says, talking about Jesus, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And that, I say, was the perfect example of faithfulness. Mm -hmm. But it is also the perfect example of obedience, humility, meekness, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Gentleness. Gentleness. Okay? So let me start this week's session with this. The words of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Matthew 11, 29 and 30, all right? Jesus said, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. We need to learn to be gentle and humble, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't come to us naturally. No. Yeah. It only comes to us supernaturally. Pride is the natural state of man. Yes. <clears throat> By the way, uh, the King James uses the word meek, I believe, right? But that's because meek is, is kind of a, a, an old English word that means the same thing, being gentle. But a lot of people think people who are meek are wimpy. Well, I think people are going to think, let me t tell you, I, and I, I, I've said this a lot of times in all of our Bible studies, I don't ask you to take my word for anything. I say, you know, test the things I say. But the only way you can test them is not because you like the way I look or the like the way I say something, but it's either, it either lines up with the Word of God, it either is the Word of God, mm -hmm. or toss it out. Don't pay any attention, all right? So, I think that tonight should offend a lot of people. Okay. Yeah, and I think a lot of people should be upset. But if you get upset, remember two things. It says in Psalm 119, verse 165, those who love thy law, God's word, mm -hmm. will have great peace and nothing will offend them. That's right. 
So if you love God's word, nothing's going to offend you. You know, you can just, if it's not the word of God, just disregard it. If it is the word of God and you get offended, you better examine yourself really, really good. All right? God's told the prophet Jeremiah to speak to his people, commanding them, do not learn the way of the heathen. Don't learn the ways of the world, the unbelievers, all right? Now, remember, we just heard, Jesus said, learn from me. So clearly, those are the two educational choices defined by the Bible. You're either going to you're either going to learn from the Word, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, or you're going to learn from the world. Right. Those are the only two choices. Now, when you were born, we came into this world. I, I I'm tempted to say we came into this world stupid. That's not quite true, but we did come into this world ignorant. I mean, when you were born and you came out of your mother's insides, you didn't know that two plus two equal four. I mean, you, <laughs> you, you come into the world knowing nothing. I mean, the only thing you got going for you is you know how to scream. That's it. <laughs> you know how to cry. Not really. You come into the world ignorant. So it takes education. You know nothing when you come start. So there's a process. As you grow, you gain knowledge. You gain knowledge. But you gain knowledge for a lot of places. You gain knowledge from, you should gain knowledge from, from everything as you pass through the world. But true understanding and wisdom come only from being born again and learning from the Word. Because the wisdom we have before that <coughs> is earthly, natural, and demonic. And I'm actually going to quote that scripture here momentarily. But no, you're right. That's from James. So th Jesus was saying to those Jews, who had believed him, if the Jews are the chosen people of God. All right, here's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Not all the Jews believed in him. No. He was the promised Messiah of Israel. Mm -hmm. All right, but the people of God, not all of the people of God believed in him. No. Don't for a minute think that all Christians believe in him. That's right. Not according to the word. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you stay in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Yes. That's John 8, 31 and 32. So he's saying, if you're in the Word, you stay in the Word, you abide in the Word, these are the, you know, if you continue in the Word, these are the words that are used in different translations. He's saying, if you stay in the Word, you're going to know what's true and what's not true. Mm -hmm. And that'll set you free, it'll make you free. Well, the alternative is, if you're just learning from the world, you're going to be, you're not going to be free. You're going to be in bondage. You may be in bondage to fear, to anxiety, to other people. I mean, but the only thing that can set you truly free is the Word of God. Jesus came to set the captives free. That's what it says in Isaiah. So the alternative is to learn from the world, which you're either going to learn from the Word by abiding in the Word, or you're going to learn from the world, which the Apostle John says is in the power of the evil one. In, John, in 1 John 5, 19, the Bible says that this present world is in the power of the evil one. Now, a lot of people, and I'm, I'm not going to get too sidetracked, but a lot of people think that the world is in control, in the control of, you know, either the Democrats or the uh, Republicans here in this country, or the, the, the liberals or the Tories or whatever in England. What, you know what? This present world is in the power of the evil one. And those are all puppets. They're all puppets in the, in the hand of the devil. That's what the Bible says. Check it out. The only way you can escape that is to be set free by Jesus Christ, all right? Be born again. All right? Because if, if it's in the power of the evil one, he is, Jesus said, a liar by nature and the father of lies. He's a thief, Jesus said, who comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But he's a particular kind of thief, all right? Satan has no power over a believer, none whatsoever. He can't force you to do anything. Remember the old skit with, uh, what was his name, Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it? Mm -hmm. The devil can't make you do it. Not if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. He can only convince you, try, or try to convince you to do it. He can't force you to do anything. So he's a thief, but he's a particular kind of thief. He's a con man. Mm -hmm. He has to talk you into giving up what's rightfully yours. That's how con men work, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you hear about crime levels, and I, I use this a lot coming from New York. 
He comes from New York too, by the way. He was a oh, cop. He was a cop in New York. Okay. There's a lot of crime, petty crime in New York. People bonk you over the head and take 25 bucks, whatever cash you're carrying around. Bernie Madoff in New York. He stole 50 billion dollars and never forced a dollar out of anybody's pocket. He was a con man. He talked them into giving the money to him. That's what Satan does in the life of a believer. He will always try and talk you into giving up what's rightfully yours. And if you listen to the devil, see, because it's all about what, there's, there's knowledge, there's understanding. You can, you can know something now, but knowing how to use that knowledge is what's called wisdom. You understand, right? Does that make sense to you? If, if you misuse what you know, that's not very wise. Yeah. Right? But there's two kinds of wisdom. There's wisdom, let me read you what, what Alice mentioned a minute ago from the letter of James, chapter 3 and verse 15. If you're getting your wisdom from your learning from the world, it says this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. That's not three kinds of wisdom. That's one kind of wisdom with three adjectives. If you're not getting wisdom from God, you're getting wisdom from the... That's only two. Jesus said you're either for me or against me. I think a lot of, a lot of people, Christians and, and otherwise, feel comfortable thinking that there's a lot of gray area here to work in. There's a fence to sit on, and that's simply not true. Jesus said you're either for me or you're against me. It's one or the other. It's on and off, right? And if you're not operating in wisdom from above, wisdom that comes from the Word of God, you are operating in wisdom that is, it's earthly, it's, it comes from the world, mm -hmm. but it, and it's natural, mm -hmm. but it's demonic. Mm -hmm. That's what the Word says. Now, let, let me make something perfectly clear before I take another step. <clears throat> if you don't believe the Bible is true, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, go turn on the telly and watch some silly television show. Everything I'm saying is based on, I believe the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And I believe, like Paul said on the, on the deck of a ship, it will turn out exactly as God has said. Okay, so the question becomes, if there's two, two ways to learn, either you're going to learn from Jesus, mm -hmm. who is gentle, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Or you're going to learn from the world. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't turned on the news lately, mm -hmm. you may not realize the world is not gentle. The world is engulfed in violence. Is that true? Yes. Mm -hmm. Every single place you look. It's, it's chaos. It's chaos and violence. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question becomes, where did you go to school? Where did you get your education? From the world or from the world? And, and more importantly is, instead of saying, where did I get my education from, is, where am I going to school? Mm. You know, where am I looking? Because education doesn't stop. It never, ever stops. Mm. Every day, you, you, you should be growing. It says that the calling of God in our lives is an upward call. The promise of God is that He will, that he will transform us. He will bring us from glory to glory. It's supposed to be a process where he is conforming us into the image of his son, Jesus. So there should be something different in your life today than what was in your life yesterday. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be growing. If you stay in God's word, I promise you, you will grow in your knowledge of God's word. Because it says in Hebrews that it's a living word. I mean, you, you can read a verse a thousand times and go read it the thousand and one time. Mm -hmm and see something that you never saw before. Because God can say something new to you through that. I think like every day we should be throwing off old habits. Well, we have to. I mean, that's what Paul meant in Romans 12 when he said we have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Okay? Uh, when we talk about getting educated, and I'm talking about getting educated in the word, the unfortunate fact is that all too often religious leaders Listen, the religious leaders of the Jews in the time of Jesus Christ and many Christian teachers after them have chosen to educate people in the world's ways. Uh, I'm, yes. 
Oftentimes, the curriculum that comes dressed in religious robes is called tradition. Jesus said to a group of Pharisees and scribes who had come to test him, as they always did, and they questioned him, and he said to them, you hip, this is, this is the, the leaders of the Jewish people. This is the religious teachers of his time. And Jesus, he was meek. He was humble. Yes, he was shy. gentle. But he looked at them and said, you hypocrites. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. It's Matthew 15. I promise you that today there are many, many men of the cloth, religious leaders, mm -hmm. teachers, and they're not teaching the Word of God, they're teaching the traditions that have been built in the church <coughs> over the past 2,000 years mm -hmm. and beyond, all right? The Sermon on the Mount, that's in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, that, that to me is the most radical sermon ever, ever, ever preached. Well, that is, that is Christianity. It is what Christianity, it's normal Christianity. Yes. That's what, that's what, there's common Christianity, which is what you see a lot of, and then there's normal Christianity. Normal Christianity is the Sermon on the Mount in Jesus' teaching. This was his initial teaching. This is a, the first major sermon he preaches, and he preaches it to his disciples, and that's when he names, first names the apostles, and he's teaching his apostles and disciples, and he's preparing them for their place in the world as ambassadors, his ambassadors, by training them in righteousness. Now, that's what the Word of God does. The Apostle Paul, in, in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16 and, and 17, he says, the, the Word of God is God-breathed and profitable, right? All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. You know, that's, we came into the world in the natural, knowing nothing. The simple fact of the matter is, you came into new life, being born again, the same way. Right. You know I mean, nothing about the you, didn't, you didn't yeah. get born again in that minute. You knew all of the scriptures in the Bible. Yeah. You came in ignorant of the word, so you have to, the same way as when you were a child, you had to learn these things. Now as a Christian, you still have to learn these things. Mm -hmm. But instead of learning the ways of the world, you're learning the, the word. The, the ways of the Lord. All right? So, in the very first seconds of that teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, which stood in stark contrast to what they had been taught, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, said this, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the gentle. This then has to become the character of a gentleman. Mm. I've never, I don't think I've ever offended anybody by calling him a gentleman. But I don't think most people associate that with being a, a gentle man. No. Because in the world, it's proper. we're not looking for that gentle quality. Mm -hmm. That's not what makes a man. Mm -hmm. A man is somebody who stands up and is ready to punch somebody in the nose. The, the strong, silent type. Where, I mean, really. This is, what, this is the way a man is portrayed by everything in the world, being a tough guy. Mm -hmm. Is that a reasonable statement? Mm -hmm. But one of the, I mean, if you call somebody a gentleman, you're, you're complimenting it. Yes. But that, what does it mean? Gentle man, right? Jesus went on to say, you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was a tradition. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Matthew 5, 38, 39. And then he said, You've heard it, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 43, 44. How many times have you heard this preached in a church? about loving your enemies. I mean, in reality. Probably a handful of times. Just a handful. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're being trained by the world to hate our enemies. Now, I, I'm gonna just be realistic about this thing and say, 
it really upset me. It, it troubled my spirit. For example, like when uh, Saddam Hussein was executed and Christians around the world rejoiced and celebrated. Let me first of all tell you that it says in Proverbs, do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Now, does that mean that I don't think he needed to be punished? That he was evil? Of course he was. But it's not the ministry of the church to carry out that. It, is the, it says that the government has been given the sword to protect us from evildoers. That is the ministry of the world. But we've been given a ministry of reconciliation. You know, it says in the Bible that God desires that none should perish. None. Is that true or is it not true? It's I mean, true. so does that mean when he says he doesn't desire that anybody, that's the people we like. He doesn't desire the people we like to perish. No. So who did Jesus die for on the cross? When, when Jesus hung on that cross and said, Father, forgive them, who was that for? All believers. No, all people. All people. Who's, but whosoever will accept it and receive it. Mm -hmm. All right? So, you know, if he didn't accept it, well, he went that day to meet his maker, and he'll answer, you know, for his choices. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, that shouldn't, that shouldn't cause us joy if it doesn't, I promise you, it doesn't cause the, the Lord joy. If he says he desires that none should perish. When Jesus saw people refusing to accept him in Jerusalem, it says he wept over the city. He didn't rejoice that, you know, that they were going to get their upcomings. Upcomings? Upcomings? Yeah. I think that's it. That sounds better. <laughs> upcomings. Yeah. That sounds okay. like something I would say. So he goes on. I mean, I, I, you could talk about this all through the Sermon on the Mount. But get it, the idea that this is the, the conflict between the religious tradition and the teaching of the Word, mm -hmm. the Prince of Peace. In Matthew 7, he said, still in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Now, the Apostle Paul got the message, and he passed it along. Think about his teaching in the letter to the Romans, when he said in chapter 12, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Never take your own revenge. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I'm just going to tell you, Allison and I have had the opportunity to travel to, and visit with churches in many, many parts of the world. That is not the attitude I find. No. It is absolutely not the attitude I find. Um, we were... I was asked one time to, uh, we were in the capital city of a country in West Africa, and there was a, a, a denomination where a number of churches were being, literally being persecuted by the government to the extent where the government had burned down their main uh, denominational church building and really persecuted. So they asked if I would come and, and pray with the pastors. With the pastors. Yeah. So I went, and uh, I don't know, there were a large, large group of pastors there. And I began to pray, and I asked God to bless these people that were persecuting the church. Now, that probably wouldn't sit well with most American Christians, but I promise you, it did not sit well with those African pastors who, in their, in their heritage and tradition, and they have just a, a, a tradition of vengeance. You know, you go get your enemies. That they grew up in, in tribes and in villages. That's still true today. They were, they were expecting you to pray so, for God you know, to smite them. It's like everybody bows their head and they go, I start mm -hmm. praying. I start praying for God to bless the enemies. And it was like, oh, what a, what a shock rippled through this group yeah, of pastors. Yeah. But afterwards, the bishop of uh, the main bishop of this denomination came up to me and he said, you know, I think this will change. He said it would revolutionize, revolutionize. the church. In camera. Well, I wasn't going to mention any names you know, oh, to protect sorry. the innocent. Well, we could beat but, that. <laughs> but, but, but the fact of the matter is, a year later, I went back to preach again at a large conference there. And in that year, I went. The conference that I preached at, that I was a speaker at, was at the, the old presidential palace in that country. Because in one year, the government had gone from persecuting them 
to supporting them and helping them. To give them this because place to have it. instead of trying to figure out how to get even with the government or change the government, they started praying for them and loving them. The word of God, God watches over His word to perform it, and this is this is against everything that you know in the natural. The house of God means no harm. Yeah, well, yeah. And <laughs> it's a, good. don't pay back evil for evil to anybody. You know, it's like if your enemy is hungry, feed him. But you know what? What was astounding there too is that a lot of these pastors were enemies with each other. Oh yeah. And they started going to each other and asking them for you know, forgiveness, forgiveness. Which, by the way, is very much so, the teaching uh, yeah, in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. And it was he, they. They said it was just amazing the results, what happened yeah. to them because yeah. of that. I mean, that's a basic, simple teaching. The thing that is, they were, it was new yeah. to them. God's word is true. Yeah. I mean, you know, what's the worst that can happen? They kill you to death. You go home. <laughs> Jesus, true. Jesus said, "Don't fear those who can kill the body." That's right. You know, uh, again. We were in, in this, this past summer, we were in uh, East Africa, over in Kenya. And we had arrived in Kenya a, a couple of weeks, I think, less than two weeks after the international airport, mm -hmm. which was the primary international airport in all of East Africa, had been destroyed, I believe, by terrorists. And when we left, after traveling a lot of the country and teaching, mm -hmm. and, uh, two days after we left, there was a horrible attack mm -hmm on Christians by Muslim radicals from uh, Somalia and they were just torturing and killing the Christians who were caught in this mall. I don't know if you saw that in, in the news. It's, this is serious stuff. This is life and death. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a joke and it's not just a theory. It's not just, you know, something I told. This is, this is life and death for, for so many people around the world. Um, <clears throat> I was talking to a, a pastor from Mombasa and I was teaching in a seminary, teaching a college course for bishops and pastors. And this pastor said to me, well, there's a great influx of Muslim radicals coming down that coast into, you know, and, and, and he said, what, what are we supposed to do? I said, pray for them and love them. Well, that is so antithetical, so, so opposite of what their nature, but it's opposite of all our human nature. No, I mean, that's, you know, it, our flesh it, wants revenge. Yeah. Our flesh, yeah, we want to strike out. Yeah. We want to overcome them. Mm -hmm. Well, God wants us to overcome them too. With love. Overcome evil with good. I, you know, I, I, and when we were doing this thing, we were talking about peace. I talked about the fact, you know, I'm 70 years old here, and I grew up, I was, I'm, more, I'm not a baby, I'm not a baby boomer, is that the term? I'm a war baby. <laughs> I'm a war baby. I was born in the war. I mean, my entire life, I have been surrounded by war in the world. And, you know, I grew up watching the Korean War, which we lost. I mean, here we are, how many years later? 60 years later? And that's, not still, that's still not resolved. No peace treaty has ever been signed. And then, of course, I was in the military uh, when Vietnam started up. And I was, without that, and I, do, I am not lying to you, I was a war monger back then. I promise you, and I've said this before, when I was not saved, I was very unsaved. <laughs> I mean, I was, forget about it, I wanted to bomb everybody in here. But sometimes, in retrospect, I wonder if we would not have been better off, it would be hard to figure out how we could have been worse off, mm -hmm. would we not have been better off just sending the bombers across and throwing out box lunches and Bibles. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it couldn't have turned out worse. Uh, I'm not... I, I would hate to say, because, you know, I'm a peacenik, because the connotation of that is something different than what Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Because Jesus is looking for victory. It's not that we're supposed to lose, but it depends on your perspective of what counts as victory and what counts as loss. Right. The Apostle Paul, I mean, read his story in the letters to the Corinthians, the two letters to the Corinthians. Here is a man who was persecuted in ways that we in the, in the Western world can't begin to conceive of. Mm -hmm. Beaten times without number, shipwrecked, nights in the deeps, homeless, hungry, 
All these things going on, endangering the country, endangering the city, endangering from his countrymen, endangering, this is what he says. But he says he always walked in triumph in Christ Jesus. So how do you face these conflicts and, and say, I walk in triumph? Because God will always give you the victory. That may not be obvious to the world, but it's like, you know, let's go back for a minute to the most horrific persecution that ever existed. Where we started this study, the cross of Jesus Christ. Beaten beyond belief. Mocked. Spit upon. Mocked by putting a crown of thorns on his head. Un totally, unjustly. I, I mean, Pilate knew he was innocent. Mm -hmm. And still, I find no guilt in this man. Crucify him. Right. And sends him off to be crucified. That's as unjust as you can possibly get. And that would appear to be the biggest loss that you could conceive of. Think of the people that were following him. Mm. All of their hope was wrapped up in Jesus Christ. All of their hope was wrapped up. And all of a sudden, they see him crucified, executed like a common criminal. That was Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Right till Sunday. <laughs> that wasn't Sunday. That's right. Because God will always vindicate your faithfulness. Yes. God will always vindicate you in your obedience. God will always give you the victory. Yes. No matter what it looks like to the world. Mm -hmm. No matter what it looks like to yeah. others. If I, he, because He is faithful. And that's what we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. Trusting in the faithfulness of God. That's what faith is. That He loves you and He will deliver you. He is your deliverer. Hallelujah. Pardon me. Sasha, come here. Come here. Can't be snoring through this whole thing. Sorry about that. So what makes you think he won't snore over here? Well, I'm like, we'll have to snore. Come on. Okay. Well, <laughs> introduce Sasha. That's Sasha, Sasha the dog. Come here. Come here. And of course, we Good do girl. know that the come Word here. of God says that we're to go preach the gospel to all creation. Yeah. She, she was here for last week's five. Yeah, so that counts too. for puppy dogs and kitty cats. <laughs> all, right. all right, but just think, this we're supposed to have a new nature. The, a new attitude, the attitude of the new man, Paul says. Mm -hmm. Listen to this from Colossians. But now you also put them aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. This is the thing. We, we, gotta we have to have this determination to live a new lifestyle now that we have new life. And this is the purpose of examining yourself. If you see areas in your life that look just like the world, well, there's a way to deal with that. It's called repentance. And as I say, it always boils down to choices. God is pro-choice. Yes. I know that upsets a lot of people. But he said in Deuteronomy, he said, I set before you life and death. He said, I set before you the blessing and the curse. He says, choose life. He gives you a free choice, but he always tells you the right choice to make. Yes. So here, it's like he's giving us that choice. Are we gonna are we gonna repent? If you don't repent, you know what most people do? Most people don't just ignore it. If you're confronted, and the Holy Spirit's good at tapping you on the shoulder, mm. especially when you are willing to examine yourself, because what you're doing is saying, Okay, Lord, show me. See it. So either you will repent, or you know what you'll do? You'll make Excuse. excuses. Hmm. You'll, you'll excuse why you're doing what you know to be wrong. Hmm. And excuses are the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill yeah. repent. Because as long as you're making excuses, you'll never repent. That's right. Okay. So, but now, just for a moment, let's go back to the old man and the old fallen human nature. Outside of that lost paradise of the garden, the Garden of Eden, right? What's the first thing basically that happens when they get outside the garden? They're kicked out, expelled, because sin separates you from God. That's what it says in Isaiah 15. It says, Adam knew Eve, she conceived, and bore a son. Mm -hmm. So Cain is his son. He's the first guy ever born outside the garden. He's the first guy that comes into this world with that old sinful new nature. The first one. Born in sin. He was the first one born in sin, right? 
He became angry. And I, I believe that he was angry at God, not, not Abel. But then he takes out that anger on his brother and murders him. And that's where it starts. Until the time of Noah. Now, you won't... Don't ask me to talk about the movie that's coming out, Noah. Don't, don't, don't. Okay, I don't know what Bible it was. Okay. Now, the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. What would make the earth corrupt in the sight of God? You, you can think of a lot of sins in right now. But here, and the earth was filled with violence. The God, God saw the violence. He's the Prince of Peace. This is the opposite. Violence is the opposite of gentleness. He came, he said, what did he say? Learn from me, for I'm gentle. Mm -hmm. Love is always gentle. Now, God disciplines those whom he loves. Do you want to know something? He'll always do that with gentleness. The reason that the world doesn't discipline children so much anymore is because they don't understand how to discipline in love. Right. And if you're not disciplining in love, you're abusing that child. That's right. By the way, if you disagree with me, write to John. <laughs> I, I'm always open, listen, to hear from you. You know, this is, I, as much as we can possibly make this a dialogue across the internet, write to me at office at BibleTalk.com. You know, I'm, I'm willing to discuss this with anybody because it's the Word of God. I'm not, I'm trying my very, very best never to give you my opinion. I just want to give you what the Word of God says. Because you want to know something? There's no life-giving power, in my opinion. Not at all. True. Sure. But there is life-giving power. There is power in the Word of God. Absolutely. All right. All right. So God destroyed the, the world by, by flood, flood, right? Mm -hmm. Always saving that remnant, which he will still continue to do. But because of the violence. Now, this is what's spoken of the king of Tyre. But it's referring to Lucifer himself, who was in the garden, Satan, with Adam and Eve. Right? And God spoke to the prophet Ezekiel and said, By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. God's not a fan of violence. God is love. That's what it says. Right? We seem to crave violence. Turn on the television, go to a movie. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just jam-packed with violence. Games that kids play. Uh, totally yeah, filled with violence. We are surrounded by violence. And this is a danger because there's so much of it there and it is so approved of that Satan is always subtly trying to convince you that it's all right. What I'm saying to you here tonight is it's not all right. Yeah. We have to be that people that bring the peace of God, the love of God, the gentleness yes. of God yes. into every situation. Okay. I don't know where I'll go here. <laughs> institutional Christianity, that's the term I want to use. Institutional Christianity was, came, was, came up to, birth, to, to life, was fully birthed mm -hmm. uh, under the Roman Empire Emperor Constantine back in the, the fourth century. Okay. Right? After he declared that God had spoken to him at the Milvian Bridge, telling him to conquer. Now he's fighting with others who are contending for, the, for that seat as Roman Emperor. And his army has massed across this bridge from another army. And he says he saw a sign, and the sign mm -hmm. said, showed him a cross in the sky and said, Conquer in this sign. So they put crosses on all the shields or whatever and went out and slaughtered a lot of people. S conquer, kill in the sign of the cross. That is the greatest contradiction in all of human history. Okay? Love yeah. conquers all. That's what it says. And love never fails. From there, there is a history of the most ungodly violence done ever under the banner of the church. The Crusades, the ongoing persecution of the Jews, the Inquisition, 
the pervasive sexual abuse of children, on and on and on. The church is filled with violence, yeah. and it's tolerated. Jezebel. It's time for the church to be led by the word and deal with these things. It shouldn't, it shouldn't take an outside agency to come in and have to deal with, with what's clean wrong up. to clean up the church. No, it's not. Okay, the Lord tests the righteous. That's us. Mm -hmm. And the wicked. You know, everybody's going to meet their maker. Yes. Whether you're a saint or a sinner, we're all going to come to that place where we meet Jesus Christ. And this is what we talked about not long ago, where you're either going to hear from him, depart from me, you evil one, I never knew you, or you're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. Mm -hmm. But it says, the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. That's Psalms, Psalms 11, 5. You gotta, you know, def listen, like I said, I'm, I'm not gonna give you my opinion. You gotta define, what do you think violence is? You know, is it, is it not about, the word actually has to do with strength. It's like trying, trying to overcome somebody by your strength, even if it's intimidation. If it's con conking them on the head or just bullying them, mm. that's, and I said that that's glorified in our world. Yeah. Tell me that's not glorified in our world today. Yeah. Until you see the reality of it. I mean, you know, it's like, I don't, uh, we see it on all the television shows. You know, it gets real in a lot of places we go to. Yeah. Like, like I said, you know, we were over on, in, in Kenya this past summer ministry, and these, Radical Muslims were slaughtering Christians in this mall. Slaughtering, torturing them, and then killing them. That's violence. Yes. And that's, there's, nothing, there's nothing good about it, there's nothing nice about it, nothing attractive about it. Nothing redeeming about it. But then we come and we watch the movies and we love to see people blown up and bashed. That has to have an impact on us. Mm -hmm. It does. I mean, you, there's a lot of ways to deny it, and I think most Christians will deny it. It'll harden your heart. Well, that's the danger. It, it, you become inured. You become, right. you know, immune to the to, to the visibility. And by the way, a lot of tests have been done on this. Uh, you know, violence doesn't upset you anymore. Huh. I almost but, believe that some of our sense has gone because we have intensified the violence and things on TV and commercials and. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Last week, I think shut yes. parts of ourselves down. Exactly. Yeah. A week or two ago, I was talking about mm -hmm. um, during the Super Bowl, which is just passed here in the United States, how companies were spending four and a half million dollars to buy thirty seconds of time, plus millions of dollars to produce commercials to get into your head for thirty mm -hmm. seconds. Yes. Don't think your mind can't be changed. Okay. I mean, because they believe it can, right? You're going to be your your mind will be changed by what you allow in. You are what you eat, as somebody Your once senses, said, right? Yeah. All right? But you choose, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Jeremiah said, thy word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy and delight, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or you're gonna, you're gonna stuff yourself with what the world has to offer. It will affect you. It, absolutely, it will affect you. God wants you to be that person who brings his love, his gentleness, his kindness into every situation. Talking about the devil, I'm just in Ezekiel 28, he says, By the abundance of your trade you were internally filled with violence. Therefore I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. We're surrounded by violence, and it has to have an effect if you, if you keep taking it in. I just want to tell you, I mean, television was not as pervasive when I was a young guy, and I told you how old I am, all right? I mean, um, there might have been three television stations and there were mm -hmm. not, not an awful lot of television shows. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there were many, you know, all, the, all of the violence was the cowboy movies and the guy with the white hat always beat the guy with the black hat. Yes. But they were loath to kill evil. anybody. Yeah. I mean, think about it. And it may have been ridiculous, but you know, they could from a thousand yards away pull out a pistol and shoot somebody's gun out of their hand. It was, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, this is the truth. Yeah. If you watch some of the old movies, even from like the 30s and 40s, mm. and you watch people get shot and die, they don't know how to die. No, they didn't. 
They, they don't. It's, you know, we look at it and say, well, it's so corny. It's corny because they didn't have the experience. They didn't know what it looked like. Now, now today, it's so realistic. Yes. Too realistic. When I went to school, I don't think that I heard of too many instances of kids bringing guns to school and shooting people yeah. and shooting kids in school. I don't think that happened a lot when I was a kid. I mean, yes, there may have been schoolyard little you know, fisticuffs and everything, but the, viol the scale of violence, the scope of violence, has just been increasing and increasing and increasing really? in the world. Okay? Sin is increasing in our world today. Thank God it says where sin abounds, grace, grace all the more. Don't give up on God because God's not giving up on you. Okay. Just remember, the one, the person who loves violence, God's soul hates. One of the most significant prophecies of the coming Messiah came when Isaiah wrote that he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah 53, 9. Isaiah 53 is the, the, the penultimate prophecy of Jesus coming, right? It says he wouldn't, there's no violence and no lying. He is the truth. He is the way. What's the way? The way is a way of peace. In the truth and life. So surely the most perfect example of gentleness is the one who had all power. Well, you ever read or pray the prayer we call the Our Father? For thine is the kingdom. Power. The power. He has all power. When he was in the garden, remember when after the Last Supper and he goes into the other garden and he prays and now he goes into the garden and the Roman Judas comes and the Roman soldiers come to take him. And it, it says one of those, it was Peter, behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and He will at once put my, at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? Mm. He knew that. Twelve legions. That's like seventy-eight thousand, right? One, one angel. When when. Uh, not the Amalekites. One of those guys who was attacking Jerusalem. Yeah. There was a lot of them. Yes. Yeah. 86,000? No, 180. 186, 185 or 186,000. Yeah. God sent one angel. And he wiped them out. And he wiped out the entire army. <laughs> one, one angel. One angel. Jesus said he could call, God would give him, the Father would give him 78,000 angels. Why didn't he ask? Because he chose, he was, he was submitted, he was humble, he was obedient, and he trusted in the Father. 78,000 angels. Then, not long after that, the Lord of hosts standing before a person who thought he had all the power. Who had all the power? Caesar was the ruler of the world. Pontius Pilate was Caesar's man on the spot. Pontius Pilate had all the power there was. The worldly power. Mm -hmm. All of the worldly power there was was wrapped up in Pontius Pilate in Israel. Mm -hmm. Jesus is standing trial before him. And Jesus just isn't talking to him. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you? And I have authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason... He who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Talking about Judas, right? Mm -hmm. That's John 19. Jesus knew that the Father could deliver him out of that situation in an instant. But he also trusted that the Father was in control of the situation. That Pontius Pilate would have no authority except the Father gave it to him. And he was in constant communication with the Father during that All whole, the time. That yes. whole situation. I, I just once, and I don't want to make this sound over dramatic or anything, but I had somebody stick a gun in my face one time when I, when I was ministering. And I, I just said to him, I said, you, you can't pull the trigger 
unless God allows you. And I mean, that's that's the answer. I mean, could he have pulled the trigger? If God wanted him to, he could have. But if God didn't want him to, he could not have. And I believe that with all my heart. God is in control. Yes. And when you come to that place where you understand that God is in control, that's when you are free. Yes. That's when you don't have to no, defend yourself. No fear. Mm. You know, no fear. look at the battles between the Philistines, which kind of still raging today, but the battle between the Philistines and the Jews in the time of, of King Saul, when David was a young, young man. And the biggest warrior they had, now remember, King Saul became king because he was the prettiest, the handsomest, the biggest guy in Israel. And yet, when the Philistine, Goliath, came out on the battlefield, Saul said, I ain't going out there with him. He's too big. He's too big. This was, I mean, the most terrifying warrior that they had. In the land. And David went out, this young boy went out, and he said, you come to me, saying, speaking to this giant, he said, you come to me with a sword and a shield in them. He said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. You know, I, I love that story because it says, then Goliath stood up. You know what that meant? When he saw David coming out, it says he disdained him. Yeah. He's sitting on the grass. I'm not going to waste my time. But when David confronted him and said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. Of God has attention. God has attention. I promise you that if you are walking in the spirit of God, any battle you get into, you are getting into knowing that he God Almighty, who commands all of the angels. He is the Lord of hosts, the captain of the hosts. He has, he is your deliverer, all right? Meekness and majesty. Jesus did not defend himself, nor did he attack his persecutors. And never was there a greater demonstration of strength. That is manliness. That is strength. It was this very fact that seemed to so move the Ethiopian court official traveling back home from Jerusalem who was baptized by Philip. You know the story in Acts 8? Mm -hmm. Philip is transported. He goes, <laughs> and he goes and he finds this Ethiopian eunuch and says, who's been in Jerusalem and now he's headed back to Ethiopia, right? Mm -hmm. And he's reading scriptures, but he doesn't understand them. So Philip shows up and it's like the, the Ethiopian is saying, can you explain this to me? You know what scriptures he was reading? It says it in Acts 8. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He, speaking of Jesus, was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. Then Philip opened his mouth and from beginning from this scripture he preached Jesus to him. We think, we try and make Jesus attractive to people. We try and make the church attractive to, to people. We make the buildings as pretty as possible. We bring the prettiest music. We serve coffee and donuts. Trying to draw the people in. Here's a man who was a court official in Ethiopia. A very, very, Ethiopia was a very important country back in those days. What, it, what got his attention was the humility, the, the obedience, gentleness. the gentleness, the meekness of yeah. Jesus Christ. This is why Paul, the apostle, a man who literally was used by God to change the face of the earth, said, I have determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified among you. A real man is not measured by who he can beat up, but by who he can lift up. So Paul wrote to the Corinthians, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. And that was immediately followed by him saying, let all that you do be done in love. It said, now love is the first of these fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I said, that all of that fruit of the Holy Spirit is based on the foundation of love. Okay? In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes about love. Here is the definition of love. And he said, love never fails. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And you'll never know that if you don't put it to the test. Mm -hmm. If you've been convinced by the world that the only way that you, can, that you can win a confrontation is by beating up the other guy, becoming violent, you've been lied to and you believe the lie. And it's not the world's love. No, it's not. It is the love of Jesus Christ. That's right. I'm telling you that I would not be sitting here right now 
Who killed Jesus Christ? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on this. Who killed Jesus Christ? Well, I, well, you know what? I was brought up in a religion that taught me that the Jews were Christ killers. But the simple fact of the matter is, yes, the Jews called for the death of Jesus Christ. And they hired the Italians to carry it out. Oh! Yeah, well, there you go. Well, it's true. <laughs> Put a contract in. So it, it represented, think about this, that represented the people of God and all the people of the world. Yes. Who is responsible for the death of Jesus Christ? I was. Because he died Whoa. for my right. sin. Exactly. For all of us. And you know what his response was? When we hated him, yeah. he loved us. He loved us. He when he looked out and said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they, would, what they do. I want to tell you, he wasn't just looking at those Roman soldiers, those Jews. He was looking out over time and space. He was looking straight into my eyes. He was looking straight into my heart when he prayed for me and said, Father, forgive them. If it were not for that love, if it were not for that gentleness, if it were not for that forgiveness, where would I be? I'd have no hope. And neither would you. So we need to examine ourselves and see, are we acting like the world with all that violence? Or are we acting like Jesus Christ? He said, learn from me, for I am gentle. The world is trying to teach you. Be ready to fight somebody. That's the answer. And I'm telling you now, the answer is to love them. And God will give you victory and it will touch their lives. Amen. We have a ministry of re reconciliation. We have that power. Because, not because you're a good person. Because you're not. But because it says in Romans 5, 5, the love of God has been poured into your hearts through His Holy Spirit. Fill us up, Lord. Fill us up. I'm not trying to examine the world. I'm not trying to examine you. I started this out as an exercise to really examine my own life and say, really, am I, am I lining up with God's desire in my life? And uh, praise God, I got room to go. <laughs> and you know what? He who started to work in me is able to complete it. He is the potter and I am the clay. He's still molding me and shaping me. But you want to know something? I have this assurance in my life, and you should too. And the world, all the powers of hell and all the powers of the world can't stop this. Paul wrote in Romans 8, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son Christ Jesus. Look at me now. Come back a hundred years or so from now, when I'm 170, you're going to see Jesus in me like you never believed you could. Because He is at work in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Examine yourself. So be back here next time. By the way, again, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have suggestions, if you, you know, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Or John. Or John. <laughs> <laughs> um, but be back next time, because the next time we talk about the next one, self-control. Because you want to know it takes, it takes self-control. A lot of times when you're confronted by the enemy, That's right. and you want to punch him in the nose, right. it takes self-control to be able to say, no, I choose to love him. Mm -hmm. So, before we go, on behalf of Lynn and John and Alice, I'll say goodnight, but I know Alice wants to tell you. Jesus loves you. A lot. God bless you. Until next time.